We're talking about the meaning of life on this program at this time every day. And we have tried to present a synthesized answer to the question simply because knowledge today is so fragmented that very few of us seem to be able to look at a question as cosmic as this in a complete and comprehensive way. And so that's what we're trying to do. Because of that, of course, you can't go into extreme detail in every subject that we touch upon, but we've tried to go into enough detail to at least give some intellectual undergirding to the points that we're sharing with one another. And so you know, you who have followed for the past six months, know that we have tried to proceed along the lines of dealing with questions like, is there uh, any indication of a supreme being behind the universe? What indication is there? Is there any evidence that he has revealed himself uh, to us, men and women, at any time? What is the basis for believing that he has? And then, what is the purpose for which he has created us? In other words, why are you here? Why am I here? What's the point of it? And we have reached the stage in the discussion, you remember, where we have said that the supreme being behind the universe appears to have communicated with us through a man that lived in the first century of our era and that seems to prove to our intellectual examination at least that he is more than an ordinary human being, that he is in fact uniquely related to the creator of the universe and uh, that he is not some kind of insane, uh, unbalanced uh, madman but he is, in fact, the son of the creator of the world. And we've tried to follow through what his explanation of the meaning of our lives was and is. And you remember that what he said, he is, of course, that man that is known as Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, he explained that his father made you to be his friend. That's it. That's it. His Father, the creator of the universe, made you so that you could be his friend, so that you could enjoy a continual friendship with him forever. That's it. And uh, that you can have a unique relationship with him that none of the rest of us can. And so can I. And uh, the creator of the universe, the supreme being behind it, can have a unique relationship with you that he can have with nobody else. And that's why he made you. And that's your real value. And you are as important to him as that. That's why he made you like himself. That is, he gave you the same capacities as uh, he himself has. He uh, gave you a body, in this case a physical body, uh, just as he has a spiritual body or an invisible body by which he can be perceived. He gave you a physical body made out of dust from the earth, and that's why it returns to dust. And he breathed into that body uh, the breath of his own life, his own particular spirit life. And if you say, well, what's that? Well, it's the thing that gives life to everything. It's his own very essence. That's what we mean by the spirit of the creator, or the fact that he has breathed his spirit into you. He has given you a capacity to have his spirit within you. His spirit is like his blood. It's what contains all the elements that gives him life. Or when you talk about the spirit of de Gaulle or the spirit of Churchill, you're talking about the very essence of the man. Well, that's something of what the spirit is. It's the very life and heart of God. And he breathed into you that and that combined with your body to give you a soul. And that's what uh, is explained in the early chapters of the book of Genesis, that you became, man became a living soul. And that's why we talk in terms of shipping disasters of uh, this ship went down with a uh, hundred souls aboard. 
because man is known as a soul because soul is his most characteristic uh, element. The angels have spirits, the animals have bodies. Man has a soul. He has a spirit, a soul, and a body. And uh, what we have been saying is that the way you relate to God, the Creator, is through your spirit. And many of us get into great difficulties when we try to relate through our souls because our soul is uh, indicated by the Greek word suke, which becomes our psyche, which becomes psychological, words like psychological. And it means the psychological part of us, your personality, your mind, your emotions, your will. And that is the part of you that is conscious of self. Your spirit is the part of you that is conscious of God. And the body, through the five senses, is the part of you that is conscious of the world and of things and of people. But the soul is the part of you that looks into itself and is self-conscious. And many of us, of course, have got into great frustrations with our attempts to experience God through trying to experience it through our souls. And so many of us try it through the beautiful church music, you know, or the Gregorian chants or beautiful architecture of the churches or beautiful painting or some of us are nature buffs and we think we'll find God in nature. And yet all those things come through our soul. And the soul is just a human part of us. There's nothing supernatural about it. it uh, all it can do is perceive what is going on inside yourself. That's why when you try to pray and wonder whether you've really prayed or not, all you're doing is examining the mental track in your mind of what you were trying to do a few seconds before. Because the soul is a purely human part, and it's tied to earth. And of course, uh, the only way to really get through to the Supreme Being at all is through your spirit. Now, it might be good if you would be patient with me to follow through a little more on the makeup of the personality that is presented by this man, Jesus of Nazareth, and by the people who preceded him, the writers who were used by God to write the books that are in our Bible. Now, if you say to me, well, I mean, are you going to substantiate this? Yes, I can give you your references in the Bible, but I mean, if you're not too sure of the Bible, you're not too certain about it, I'm going to come over like a wild uh, Bible-quoting evangelist. So what I will do is I'll try to outline the anthropology that is presented in the Bible or the makeup of our personalities that is outlined there, and then I can make available to you notes that will provide Bible references, and you can look them up yourself. But uh, I think it's wiser for me to give you some idea of what this man, Jesus of Nazareth, taught us about our personalities. Because I think once you begin to hear it, it'll make so much sense to you. Uh, if you've studied psychology, or you've studied science, or you've studied theology, or philosophy, uh, or anthropology, you'll begin to see how much sense this view of man makes. And uh, that will in a intuitive way uh, and an implicit way begin to give you a s conviction uh, that this is actually truth and then of course by all means followed up yourself by looking up references and thinking it through so will you bear with me as i try in the next few broadcasts to at least outline the way the creator of the universe meant our personalities to operate. And um, I think it'll help you to understand yourself and to understand the way your life goes. The personality, then, is made up of three levels or three elements, the spirit, the soul, and the body. Now, you're dead right if you say, oh, now that's the old-fashioned Heraclitus view of life. You know, it's fire, air, and water. You're splitting man up into elements. Well, no, no. I, uh, Jesus never implied that. He uh, always said that man was one. But he did imply that he existed on three different levels. And it was vital to understand those levels. So uh, we're not saying you can take out, as you can take out an appendix. We're not saying you can take out a soul and examine that. We're simply saying that this complex 
human personality works on three levels, the spirit and the soul and the body. So tomorrow, I'd like to try to begin talking about the spirit, your own spirit, and what it is meant.